Well, praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for this night, and we're thankful that you're here. Let's stand together. Brother Hayes, you start heading this way. Let's get ready to sing tonight and to worship the Lord. I'm glad that Levi is here tonight. Casey must have got a whip and whipped him and made him get out of bed or something. Glad that you're feeling better. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> Brother Wheeler, lift in prayer for us tonight. Thank you, Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege to be in your house. And thank you for these beings, the good that's been accomplished, those that are seeking the end of the Lord. Father, we pray that you'd be pleased tonight to do it, Lord, to settle down, brood over us, Lord, help yes. uh, Brother Hayes as he yes. leads us in the singing and Brother Wheeler to be anointing upon the message. We pray that you would work perfect work through the Holy Spirit yeah. tonight. And Father, for all things, we'll ascribe to you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' love and name. Amen. Amen. may be seated. <clears throat> Turn in your praise and worship hymnals to hymn number 199. 199. Holiness under the Lord.
Aren't you glad for holiness tonight? Amen. Amen. Yes. I was thinking, I was sharing with Maureen last night, <clears throat> the rich young ruler came to Jesus and says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave him a list of things that he was supposed to do. And he said, I've done all of that. And he said, uh, he said, but there's one thing thou lackest. And a lot of times it's been my experience, it was my personal experience, and in dealing with people, that a lot of times people seeking holiness, it comes down to one thing. Yeah. Just right. one thing. And that's where you have the battle, that's where the battle line. Yeah. And that one thing that God puts his finger on, you're not going to get anywhere until you yield that one thing. That's right. And uh, I, Lord help us. I was thinking about that today, and I had a, I have a preacher friend in Pennsylvania, and sometimes, sometimes it's a, it's a point of obedience. You just have to obey God. God tells you to do something, and you need to do it. And I, had my friend in Pennsylvania, he said, I heard him say, he's preaching one time, I heard him say that. When he was seeking holiness, the Lord said to him, what you've got to do is you've got to stand up in church on Sunday morning and say, I am carnal. <laughs> so that's what he did. He stood up and said, I am carnal. And then he was on believing ground to get through. We had a lady in our church, we were at camp meeting, and she was seeking holiness. We were around the altar at the camp meeting, and she was seeking holiness, and I was, my wife and I were there. She said, uh, I said, uh, Sister, I said, is the Lord asking you to do anything? And she looked up at me and she said, the Lord wants me to laugh. I said, well, I'd laugh then. <laughs> and so she started in, and she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed. How long do you think it was, that about? You know who I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Probably 20 minutes, 30 minutes, she laughed. At the end of her laugh, she was sanctified. But it was a holy laugh. It was a holy laugh. It was from the Lord. It and just different things. So just, if you're seeking God, just say, Lord, I want to, I'm going to do anything you want me to do. And if you put your, and you know, God doesn't deal in generalities. He doesn't say, well, you've got some problems. He says, you've got a problem. And he puts his finger on. And you can't go anywhere else until you deal with that thing that God's got his finger. That's right. So just do what God wants you to do. Yes. Amen. Yes. Okay, 325. This has been at a holiness revival, and we're going to sing about holiness tonight. 325. Holiness forevermore. Now you can stand.
I like to sing it. I like to shout it. I like to preach it. And I'm glad I can do it. Amen. Thank you for your Amen. Mr. Wheeler's pulling for an offering tonight. <clears throat> if you have offering, give it to the treasurer or something. They'll, they'll get it going the right direction. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. All right, Brother Evan, testify. Tell us how you're doing. I thank the Lord for how He is helping me. He's Amen. just changing, helping me to make changes. There's some things that when God gave me that promise, is like, well, Lord, don't I still need to work on this? And it was one of those things that He took on credit. And since then, He's helped me to do even better. Yes. It's yes. just like, he showed me, yeah, you haven't perfected that, that part, but your heart was in the right place. Yes. And I'm going to finish that work. Yes. And he's helped me to do better at it yes. each time. Yes. Thank so God. Thank you for that. And then there have been different things where it's just like, Lord, I'm not sure about this. I, I, want, I, I definitely want to do your will on this. I'm not sure. But I'm trusting in him he's going to help me to do that yes Amen. and it's, good. it's just i think i was just thinking about it, it's like even if i have made a mistake already i don't want i've gone too far to make to right lose it now yes if there's something i need to do to repair anything already i'm yeah. going to go back and do it so yes. That's, yes i'm that's right good i want to keep that Yes. I want to maintain it. I want to build on it. Amen. I'm, yes, I'm thankful for what the Lord has done, and I just want to keep growing with the Lord. And it's yes. Exciting to read His Word and, and to it's good. And just to listen to Him and follow yes. Him. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. The Lord sanctified Evan Monday night, and it was real. Thank yes. the Lord. Amen. We praise God for victory. Thank the Lord. Anyone else tonight need to drive down a stake or tell how you're doing? It's been good days. We've had good days. How the Lord's been helping us and guiding us and directing us. Thank the Lord. One thing about going the death route, you'll never want to have to do it again. <laughs> it just, you shallow out. Anybody can do that over and over. But I tell you what, you really go to the bottom and die out, you don't want to ever have to go through that again. <clears throat> Thank the Lord. All right, turn to the book of Ruth tonight. <clears throat> I would appreciate as I say this, no amens, all right? <clears throat> you can amen me the rest of the time, but don't amen me when I tell you this. When I preach on things, I tend to wear them out. Don't you dare. <laughs> I guess it wasn't an amen, was it? <laughs> About ten years ago, I preached through the book of Ruth. And I want to tell you, it's still a sweet book of the Bible to me. I love the book of Ruth. And uh, <clears throat> we went weeks through the book of Ruth. And I uh, don't have time to go all the way through it tonight. But you know the, the high points of the story. Uh, Naomi was a Jewish woman. A famine was on in the land. She became embittered. This was her testimony. When they saw her, first of all, she lived in Moab. Her sons, Malon and Chilion, married two Moabitish girls, Ruth and Orpah. Ten years she lived down there in Moab because there was a famine in Israel. You would imagine that she probably said to herself, I hate it here. I'm ready to get out of here. This place is awful. I'm ready to go somewhere else. And uh, she did. 
She and her husband got their wagon loaded and they headed off to Moab over across the river. And ten years later, she looked back and saw her life. And I want you to pick up on something in chapter 1 and verse 21. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? The word Naomi means pleasant, blessed, happy. But when they saw her after all those years, they said, she met all of her old friends and they says, Oh, is this Naomi? What? Naomi, hey, good to see you, Sister Pleasant. How are you? She said, Stop. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me Pleasant. Call me Mara. You know what that means? Bitter old woman. That's quite a name, isn't it? Don't call me Pleasant. Call me Mara bitter. Naomi lived down there. Her two sons died. Her husband died. She lost everything. And I want to tell you tonight, there's a lot of people who walk away from the holiness church and the holiness movement thinking it's so bad, but years later they come back. And you know what? Verse 21, I went out full. Do you think when she left, heading down to Moab, Brother Hayes, she thought she was full? No. She didn't. She's ready to get out of there. She's sick of all this. Tired of living here. and They're nothing, but I'm sick of all the hypocrites. And I'm tired of all the rules. And I'm sick of... So what she do? She up and ran. But years later, now I want to tell you something. Thank God she came back. But very few do. That's right. And I want to tell you tonight, this matter of getting sanctified holy, this matter of holiness of heart, if you don't deal with it somewhere down the road, it's going to lead you to Moab. Right. It's going to lead you down a road you never dreamed you'd go. You, and nobody leaves saying, I'm going all out. I'm going all the way to the world. No, they leave and... They, they head out and they say, I ain't going very far. I'm not going to, I'm just going to go out. You know, I, I'm not really going to go very far. I just, you know, I just don't think this is necessary. And I just don't think that's a big deal. And I just don't think, and that's a road that never ends. Well, finally, Naomi, I like to think she was sitting in the recliner by the window she got to looking out and she got to reflecting on all she had. I've lost my family. I've lost my joy. I've lost it all. And one day, Ruth comes in and says, Mom, what's the matter? The tears running down her face. She says, Honey, I just want you to know I am packing my wagon and I'm heading back over to the Holy Land. I'm packing things up. Mom, you're, you're really, you're, le you're going to leave this? Yep, I'm done. I'm leaving. And uh, you girls just get your things and you can go on back home and, or you can have the house and, and you can just have all this. I'm packing my wagon, honey, and I'm heading out. And Ruth said, no, I'm going with you. Oh, no, 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 honey, no, listen. I can't have any more sons, by the way. That was a custom in the days of Israel's uh, here that we read about, if, if a son died, then a younger son would marry the wife of the older brother and would bear children if, if that younger son wasn't married yet and would raise that family. And uh, she said, honey, I can't have any more children. I'm too old. I'm bereft of everything. There's, you, you can't go. J just stay here. No, I'm going with you. And pretty soon Orpah comes running in and she says, Mama, Mama, what, what are y'all talking about? And Ruth says, well, I'm moving. I'm going back down to Bethlehem, the house of bread. Oh, goody, 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 I love a trip. Oh, there's nothing better than going on a vacation. No, Orpah, 
this isn't a vacation. I'm moving. Oh, good, fine, I love it. Let's go. Oh, what's over there? Let's go. I, do they have botanical gardens? And, and do you know if they have symphonies over there? And, oh, I just love to go. And Orpa, listen, why don't you just stay here? Oh, no, you're my mother-in-law. I love you. I want to go with you. And they just start packing the wagon, and Orpa's so happy. She's just jumping around, clapping her hands. Oh, this is so exciting. I'm just so happy. This is so good. Oh, this is so thrilling. I just can't wait. Ruth, aren't we excited? Aren't we happy? And... They get in the wagon and they start heading that way and pretty soon they have a flat tire. And they call AAA and AAA can't send anybody. And they look around, there ain't much. And, and uh, they say, well, look, let's dig in the trunk, see if we can find something to get this wheel off the ground. And I don't see a spare on this wagon. What are we going to do? And, and uh, finally Naomi says, well, I guess what we take, we're going to have to carry. And Orpa says, oh, my back hurts. I've had back trouble for years. I need to go back. And Orpah turns and goes back. And Naomi turns to Ruth and says, It's okay, honey, you can go. She says, No. Where you go, I go. And where you live, I live. And your God will be my God. Oh, listen, Ruth. And Ruth looked at her and said, Speak no more of it. I'm going. What can I carry? And Naomi turned around and Ruth and they grabbed things and away they went and they started off down the road with what little bit they had and they get back to Bethlehem. They get back to the house of bread. All the friends gather around. But folks, they're still poverty stricken. They still don't have very much and, and they're, they're trying to make it along. And now in chapter 2, it says in verse 1, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Let me now go in, or to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And right there, we have the first picture of divine grace. And so uh, she said unto her, Go, my daughter, verse 3, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her hap. You know what that word means? Her luck. By chance. Do you think this was by chance? Absolutely not. We call this the leadership of the Spirit of God. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And I want to pause right now. That servant is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And Boaz is a picture of God the Father, the Bridegroom, God, the, the Jesus, the Bridegroom. And I want you to know tonight, the eye of God catches every soul that starts moving toward God. And the Holy Spirit picks up on your heart and its thirst. And I want you to know, I'll guarantee you, that servant, Brother Wheeler, knew this girl's story. And here comes Boaz. He's been watching and I want you to catch something. In verse 7, she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Now let me tell you what this is really saying. You might not capture this the way it's written, but she was not worthy. 
she was not allowed to come into the field with the reapers. She wasn't allowed to. She was a foreigner. She was an outcast. She didn't have Jewish blood. She didn't have lineage. She wasn't worthy. She wasn't allowed. But she came to the servant and said, Would you allow me to gather today in your fields? And he gave her permission. But I'm guaranteeing you tonight, he already knew a little bit. This girl left her gods. This girl clung to her mother-in-law. It tells us that later, that she abandoned it all. I want to tell you tonight, when people abandon the world and abandon their sin, they get the eye of God. And the Holy Spirit is watching. And you may feel like a beggar and unworthy, but I got news for you. He got his eye on you. He's a watching your soul. You say, you don't know what all I've done. You don't know where I came from. Thank God I don't. But there's one who does, and he's watching. <laughs> Hallelujah. i got to keep going. Then said, verse 8. Wait, I want to finish this. So she came in verse 7 and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Let me tell you what was happening. You know what the reapers were doing? They were like most workers today. They were up in the break room. They were over hanging around the water pitcher. But not, not her. He saw her diligence. I will tell you tonight. The Holy Ghost sees the diligence of a seeking heart. He said, I've been watching her. Look at how diligent she is. And look, this girl wants something. I'm going to meet her need. It gets better. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Neither go hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. She could have gone into all the other fields, but he had another test for this bride-to-be. First of all, he saw her diligence. But then he comes to her and he says, um, Daughter, God bless you. Uh, I know there's bunches of fields on your way home, but I just want you to know, if you'll abandon all the other fields and find your happiness and satisfaction and glean in my fields, just don't worry about anybody else. In fact, you go by my maidens. Now, wait a minute. Those girls would have hated Ruth. Can't you hear them standing around drinking on their water cup and watching Ruth. Here she comes. She doesn't quite fit in yet. She's not like them yet. She didn't come from their background and they're sitting around. That's a slick way to get a drink of water when you're preaching. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's empty. <laughs> and they're talking, saying, look at her. Look at her. Psst. She... Get her out of here. Throw something at her. I hope she falls down and breaks her crown. Whatever that means. But here comes the owner, the master of the field. And he says, um, God bless you, my daughter. Don't worry about going anywhere else. Stay right here in my field. He was testing her. And when you are done with every other field of satisfaction and you are ready to say, Lord, I'm just going to stay in your fields. Lord, you're stuck with me. And I want you to know, he has an excellent sufficiency to meet your every need. Verse 9, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. And go thou after them. Have not I charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst... Go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. And she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace 
in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? I'm not even worthy to be here, and yet you've loved me, you've shown grace to me. Then he said in verse 11, Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast fully left excuse me, how thou hast left thy father and the mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. Isn't that beautiful? I tell you what, when a person abandons it all, that's the problem with some people. That's why they struggle. They've got to let go of a lot of things. But I want to tell you something. When your abandonment of everything is complete, there ain't no pull. There ain't no drawing. I tell you what, I'm stuck with you. You're stuck with me, Boaz. Thank you. You've opened your arms of grace to me, and I'm here to stay. Now listen, at this moment, she thought all she was getting was a place to glean. She was just getting a few handfuls of food and oh, how nice this man, but he just kept getting nicer and he kept testing her and he said, and by the way, you see that water up there that my servants draw and set up there? You don't be shy. I want you to go up there and you just elbow your way in and you, I want to tell you tonight folks, when you abandon all and start pursuing the bridegroom, he's going to open all the resources and say, you have every much right to them as anybody else. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then she said in verse 13, let me find favor in thy sight, O Lord. For that thou hast comforted me, for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, <laughs> Come thou hither and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat and was sufficed and left. That means he served. Ain't it beautiful when you begin to notice God is serving me. God is meeting my need. He makes me feel like he wants me. He makes me feel like I'm welcome at his table. Hallelujah. Verse 15, and when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let's fall also some of the handfuls on purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Oh, man. He goes around behind her, behind her back and he says, Psst, hey, fella, <clears throat> you see that girl over there? I've been noticing she loves her mother-in-law, which is a type of the church. She loves her mother-in-law, man. She's abandoned all. That's a good girl. I'll tell you what, boys. You kind of inch her over. You see where all the sheaves are that you've already cut and gathered and bundled up? You kind of ease her that way and just let her gather over there where the big... But in fact, I want you fellas, drop some handfuls over there. And I see Ruth, she comes around and the other maidens come around with their nose turned up and they're getting a little close and the guys come out, get out of there, get her, you get back over there to the corners of the field. By the way, God told Israel, said you leave the corners of the field for the poor people. So that's what they were doing. But he said, um, you know, this girl finds grace in my sight. I tell you what, it's good to find grace in God's eyes. And she's over there. And I almost wonder if she didn't look over at those girls and go, nanny, nanny, nanny. And she starts gathering. And then she says, oh, my. Hey, fellas, 
you, you, you dropped a whole bunch. Yeah, it's okay. Our master, he's so rich, he doesn't even know that. He wouldn't even notice the difference. We have a rich master, don't we? And he gathers, she gathers, and she just grabs it by the handfuls and puts it in, and she's watching, and, and they're making sure. And then the Bible says... When she got through, not only did she gather, but there seems to be here that they let her use the equipment to beat it out. Nobody else gets to do that. They got to go home and beat it out themselves. But the master that's taking note, he's watching. He says, you just make it available. I've been watching this. This person, this is a she's hungry for God and I'm going to meet her need. Well, it even gets better. Verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought. And she said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinmen, kinsmen. Now listen. In the land of Israel... The land was divided up. A family was never to lose their inheritance. They were to take care of it. It was theirs under God and it was to be passed from generation to generation. Every 50th year, the year of Jubilee, all debts were to be forgiven. The clock was to be restarted. That was the way God designed it to continue because God knew that if he didn't restart it, people would lose everything. However, he was painting a picture. You and I lost our estate. We were born sinners, but did you know that because Jesus Christ was born of Mary, he is our near kinsman. He is our Boaz! And he owns fields of blessing. He has everything that, he, that you can ever dream of. He'll meet your every need. And guess what? When a soul starts moving toward God, God starts taking note. He starts watching. And then he starts blessing. We find grace in his eyes. But I've got news for you. Out there on the middle cross... He paid our debt so that He could buy back our lost inheritance. We lost it because of sin. We lost holiness because of disobedience. But if a soul will obey God, they get it back in entire sanctification. Now the, the light's coming on. This is our next of kin. Can you believe this? Look at verse 22. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. In other words, girl, I'm telling you, if you'll abandon everything and cling to this man, you don't be seen anywhere else. You just die out to everywhere else. And you just stay with Boaz's family. He's going to bless you. He's already taken notice of you. Verse 23, So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now verse 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Do you know that's the message of the church? There is a rest of the soul. That's the reason why we love holiness. That's the reason why we preach it. Oh, thank God to be brought into the fields of Boaz. Thank God for salvation. But God isn't finished yet. You see, folks, 
He has so much more than to make you a servant or a maiden. He wants to make you a bride. Are you listening to me tonight? He's making up his bride. He's making up his bride. And if you want to be the bride of Christ, if you want to go up when Jesus comes back, if you want to be his and totally his, I want you to notice tonight what she did and what, what Boaz did in return. Shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? In other words, that all your needs be met. And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I will do. Folks, listen. You look at this story tonight, now we're moving to another phase. She's been out in the field. She's been gleaning just uh, handfuls. She's been bringing home enough to eat. But she wants more than that. She wants to be the bride of the bridegroom. She wants Boaz. And he wants her. He had already seen her. He had already seen her virtue. He had already seen her diligence. He had seen her love of Naomi, which is a picture of the church. But ladies and gentlemen, that isn't enough. He wants us to love Him supremely more than anything else. And Naomi says, listen daughter, it's time for you to find spiritual rest. And here's how you do it. Wash thyself. Make yourself attractive to Him. I mean, come on, girls. You know, you ever seen them when they start dating? Pretty soon, man, that hair gets combed up and they start squirting foo-foo water on and all that stuff. And I mean, they're doing everything they can to look beautiful and they walk out, oh! But let me tell you tonight, don't you want to be attractive to Christ? Lord, what is it that you want in my life? That's what we're seeking for. Lord, what is it that you find attractive? What is it, Lord? And friends, a soul that wants to be sanctified, they're pursuing the heart of God. They're saying, Lord, if it pleases you, that's what I want. Lord, if I know this pleases you, that's what I want. And oh, that soul just begins to, uh, with a heartbeat for God, anything God wants, I want. Anything that pleases God, that's what I'm going for. Verse 4, When he lieth down, thou shalt mark the place. Go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. She pursued him. What have we been doing in this revival? You say, Brother Woodard, this is strange. You know, people don't do much seeking anymore. People, they try to hurry them through and get them up. Let me tell you something tonight. You're pursuing the bridegroom. You want a heart that's so committed to Him and you're willing to lay yourself down, prostrate yourself. And by the way, it's, it's of a key note here. They went to the threshing floor. Who wants to go to an old dirty threshing floor? Who wants to go there but somebody that wants the bridegroom and that's willing to lay in the dust if that's what it takes. But I'm going to have the bridegroom. And she said under verse 5, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to fully obey. I mean, full obedience brings full victory. Verse 6, And she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid. Oh, she's now humbled herself. 
the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou, the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Folks, there comes a point where God ministers to your heart and says, I see virtue in your heart. You followed me, you've obeyed me, you sold out, and all you want is purity. All you want is a clean heart. I see it, daughter. I want you to know I'm ready to meet your need. Verse 12, And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Oh, when God says, I just want you to know, I do belong to you. And I'm ready to do the work that it takes to make you belong to me. I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Who is that? Folks, we belong to Satan. That's the reason why we sing, I'm a child of the king, an alien by birth. We are not born worthy. We are not born into the family of God. But we are by the new birth because our near kinsman made the way possible. Verse 13, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part, but if not, but if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning. Folks, there may be a long night of seeking, but I want you to know, the morning's coming. <laughs> there comes a morning. There comes a breaking of the day. Jacob was blessed at the breaking of the day. Naomi, the, the near kinsman, in the morning, in the breaking of the day. This means that if, if it may seem dark and difficult, you stay with it. In verse 14, she rose up before one could know another. And she said, let it, be known that a, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city. Do you understand? She had a bunch of barley. You know what he was saying? That's just a little bit of what you're getting ready to possess. I'm going to give you some handfuls. I'm going to measure this out, but I got news for you, daughter. You're getting ready to own the fields that this comes from. And then... And then, oh, I love this. Verse 16. And when she came to her mother, mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? What? Naomi didn't know who Ruth was? Of course she did. But she had been in the presence of the bridegroom. And when she came out, she was so transformed. She had the promise. She had the assurance. And I believe she came out with such a shine on her face that when she walked in the door, Naomi looked and says, 
are you still Naomi? And Naomi said, praise God, I've been at the feet of the bridegroom and he's meeting my need. He's going to bring me into the family. I'm going to become the bride. He has already paid the price and I'm at the very door. The morning has broken and look at what I brought, mother. This is just a little taste of what's yet to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And she told her all that the man had done unto her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me, for he said unto me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he hath finished the thing this day. There comes a moment when there's a confidence that rises up in your soul. He's going to finish this. <laughs> He's going to complete it. He who hath begun a good work in you will complete it. She comes out of there and her mother says, You just wait, daughter. The answer's already on the way. He's going to pay any price. He means it. And he did pay the price. But I got news for you. We don't have to sit around and wait for the price to be paid. He already paid the price on Calvary to sanctify every soul that will come to Him. Hallelujah. Now, ah, uh, Boaz goes through the process. He purchases it back. And now let's go to chapter 4 and verse 13. And I'm ending tonight. So Boaz took Ruth. And she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women and her neighbors gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. I want to tell you tonight, when a soul gets on the trail of the bridegroom, I got news for you. He saw you long before you saw him. He's ready to meet the need. He's paid the price. And you can never know all the blessings he will bestow because he's going to take you in and make you fruitful. He's going to bless you. He's going to make you to shine with the glory of God. And you're going to bring forth spiritually children you're going to bring forth fruit under righteousness you can't do it of yourself but I tell you tonight if you'll give yourself to the bridegroom he's already paid the price he's going to meet your need and who knoweth but what out of that blessed union why think about it Obed Jesse and David came out of this a woman that should have never been and yet because she paid the price she became the wife. And it said that Naomi, a picture of the church, she nursed that child. Oh, listen, people. One reason that God can't give the church new souls is He can't put a new baby in the arms of a dead mother. We've got to be revived. Do you have any benefit to the church? If you can't carry a load, if you can't carry a burden, you are of absolutely no benefit to the church. Well, pastor, I hope somebody can carry me along. I'm sorry. 
we aren't here to carry you along. You ought to be helping carry the load. And if you don't have a burden, I don't know what to think about you. I just don't understand it. But he has brought us in that we might bear fruit. And I'm telling you tonight, it's good to be the bride of Christ. Let's stand together. Now I confess to you, I've preached about ten messages in one tonight. And you're looking at me saying, yeah, it felt like ten messages, preacher. But thank God, the bridegroom is ready. He's ready to meet the need. The altar call is in your hands tonight. If you want to pray, we'll pray with you. If you feel like you need to go home and pray, that's all right. I will tell you tonight, I've already been asked. Some have asked, are we going to finish out Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? I said, that's not my call anymore. I've been bossing everybody around. I'm tired of it. Does anybody else want us to finish up Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Yes or no? It's on you. You do? Anybody else want us to continue? Maureen, Brother Brian, Brother... Y'all want us to continue? All right. We have to go to North Dakota tomorrow. We're going to finish out Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with the help of the Lord. Now look, some of you have things I understand that are going on. You have responsibilities. I am not here to tell you that you have to abandon that. I just want you to pray for us. But I'm going to pray tonight. If anybody wants to pray, we'll pray. But if you feel like you need to go home and pray, you do that tonight. But I am not begging anybody to come to the altar. You just do what you feel you need to do. Father in heaven, we're so grateful tonight for how the Lord has been helping us in these days, Lord. We appreciate the Spirit of the Lord that's just been brooding over souls and the victories, Lord, that have been won. Oh God, we give You praise for victory. We give You thanks tonight, Lord, and we ask You tonight to satisfy every heart, Lord, with Thy sanctifying fullness. Lord, bless Brother Brian tonight. Brother Brian has come. Anybody else want to come and pray? That's what revival is all about. God bless you, Maureen.